Greetings in the name of Christ. I'm Walter Meyer III. The text we will be going over is the Old Testament reading for proper 14, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 8, a section of the Elijah history. We will first translate the text and then review it and have exegetical comment. The first verb from the verb Nagav, the subject Ahab. Now Ahab related to Jezebel all that Elijah, Eliyahu, had done, Asa. Now this is a reference back to 1 Kings chapter 18, the great story of the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Asherah and the account of his God-given victory from Yahweh. And after that, how Elijah had commanded that all the prophets of Baal and Asherah be seized and put to death, and that is what happened. Next portion. Now, literally, and all which he killed, all the prophets. Now, we can smooth it out by saying, and all about how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Next verse. Verb is shalach, to send, subject is Jezebel. So Jezebel sent a messenger, Malach, to Elijah, saying. Now we have what follows, apparently, a combination of two oath, oath formulas that we see in the Hebrew Bible. So the first portion is this. Thus may God's do and understood to me, and thus may they add, or you can smooth it out by saying, and more so. So again, here's the first portion. Thus may God's do to me, and more so. And now the second portion. Indeed, about this time tomorrow, I will place or I will make your life like the life of one of them, one of the dead prophets of Baal and Asherah. Please raise the screen. Now, the first verse here is with this word. We see this in the Hebrew text, and the Masoretic pointing is this, Yar. That would be from the verbal root ra'ah, to see. This is perhaps the most debated text critical issue in 1 Kings. Is this verb then to be understood as from the root ra'ah, to see, or from a different root? With the same consonants, wow, yod, resh, alpha, but with a different pointing, this could also be translated now, he was afraid, from the verb yare, to fear or to be afraid. And so again, much debate over this. To make a long story short, the position I take is that it's the second verb. Now, he was afraid. From the standpoint of textual criticism, that is the reading from the Septuagint and the Vulgate. Now, he was afraid. And it's easier to understand that a later scribe, after the original had been recorded, would change a verb, he was afraid, to he saw, to protect the great prophet Elijah's reputation. Rather than to say this, that the verb was originally, now he saw, and it was changed to, he was afraid. So I'm going to go with the reading that I find in the Septuagint and the Vulgate and some Hebrew manuscripts. Now he was afraid, and he arose, and he went for his life. That's a little bit stilted, so let's smooth it out by saying, and he fled for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which is to Judah, which belongs to Judah. And now the verb nuach, and he left his young man, or his attendant, his assistant, there, Sham. Next verse. And he went 
in the wilderness, a journey of a day, and he came and he sat under Rotham is broom tree. This word here can be translated as one, or in this context also it can have the nuance, a certain. Under a certain broom tree, and he asked, the verb sha'al, literally, his life, nafsho, lamuth, to die. He asked his life to die. He asked that his life come to an end. And he said, Rav here, in this context, can have the nuance, enough. The next word, ata, means now, and of course, following that is the tetragrammaton. How to understand these three words, how to divide them up, separate them, uh, various possibilities. The way I'm going to do it is this. Enough. Now, Yahweh, take my life. So from the verb lakach, imperative, take my life, because, and now a comparative, not good I from my fathers or from my ancestors, but this is the comparative usage of the preposition min. So you can smooth it out by saying, because I am no better than my ancestors. Please raise the screen. The verb shakav, and he lay down and he slept under. Now the text says, once again, uh, one broom tree or a certain broom tree, but that's a bit odd after what has preceded. Due to a text critical emendation, I'm going to translate this as under the broom tree, the one that had been mentioned already. Wahene, and behold, Zahir can have the meaning there. There was, and again the word Malak. Now is that a human messenger or is that an angel? And the context coming will make it clear to us that this indeed was an angel. There was an angel, Nogea, touching him, and he, the angel, said to him, Elijah, arise, eat. So two imperative forms here. And he looked, the verb navat, this is referring to, referring to Elijah, and he looked, and behold, now this combination here, preposition and suffix, and then in between, ra'asho, this would mean at his head, at the place of his head. So, ma ra'asho tau, at the place of his head, then ugath, a loaf of, now literally here, ritzafim, glowing coals or glowing stones. And that would have the sense, a loaf baked on glowing coals, and then safachath mayim, and a jug of water. So he ate and he drank, the verb shatha, and he returned, literally, and he lay down. With this verb shu, we could render that, and he again lay down. Next verse. And the angel of Yahweh, there we have it, the Malach Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh returned a second time, Shaneith, and touched him and said, arise, eat. So a repetition of what was said before. Because, now literally, because much from you, Haderic, Haderic here, the journey. And again, a comparative usage of the preposition min, we could smooth that out by saying, because the journey is too much for you. You know, apart from this nourishment which I'm giving you, apart from that, the journey would be too much for you. So arise, eat, and drink. Please raise the screen. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went, now literally, by the strength of that hahi food, akila, of that food. 
You could also smooth it out by saying, and he went by the nourishment of that meal 40 days and 40 nights unto, until he came, understood, until he came to the mountain of God, Horeb. That was the mountain of God, Horeb, also, of course, known as Sinai. All right, thus far, our translation of the Hebrew text. Now, a few comments by way of exegesis. Elijah apparently thought, because of what took place on Mount Carmel, and Ahab witnessed everything, that Ahab, as a result, was brought to faith in Yahweh, that he was a true believer in Yahweh, a monotheist. Now, in that, Elijah was wrong. Elijah went before the chariot of Ahab to Jezreel, and there he stayed, and he was hoping for good things now to happen. But then Jezebel sent the messenger to Elijah, and he recognized that things had not turned out as he had thought. Now, the event on Carmel had an impact on Ahab. He was not a current convert to the true faith, but he still had now great respect for Yahweh and for his prophet. Consider this. When Jezebel sends the messenger now to give her message to Elijah, she sends just one man, and it's just the messenger. She doesn't send a contingent of soldiers to arrest Elijah or to kill him there on the spot but just a messenger. And this is indicating that Ahab is not allowing Jezebel to kill Elijah. He has that kind of respect now for Yahweh and for his prophet. So Jezebel cannot kill him, but she does send him this message, which was just translated, uh, may the gods do to me and more so, indeed about this time tomorrow, I will make your life as the life of one of them, one of those dead prophets. So she's threatening to kill him, but also consider this. She's just threatening him. She doesn't kill him there in the spot or have him dragged to the palace where he will be executed. And she says about this time, tomorrow. Now why tomorrow? Well, one possibility would be this. Uh, she's thinking that, well, I have to work on my husband Ahab, and I'm thinking that maybe by tomorrow I can change his mind so that I can kill Elijah. Or perhaps it was this situation. Well, this is how Ahab is, but maybe I can scare Elijah off. I can't kill him right there, but maybe with my message I'll scare him off. Well, in that, she succeeded. We talked about that verb, which is so debated, the key text-critical issue in 1 Kings. And I took the position that Elijah was afraid, and I gave evidence then from the Septuagint and from the Vulgate. But also consider this, what has proceeded in the text, so this threat from Jezebel, and Elijah now sees that things really haven't changed that much at all, despite Mount Carmel. And Jezebel is still a dangerous force. Consider what follows. The text says that Elijah fled for his life. And also consider this, that there was no word from Yahweh which came to Elijah. So the combination of all of this leads one to propose that he was indeed afraid. And so he fled for his life. And he has initially with him his attendant, his assistant. He goes far south in Judah to get outside of the northern kingdom and away from Jezebel and her threat. And then he leaves his attendant there in Beersheba and he continues by himself then into the Judean wilderness farther south, a day's journey. And we see then the condition of Elijah from the following text. He is emotionally drained. He is despondent. 
he's disappointed, he's discouraged. There has been no major reform taking place in the Northern Kingdom because of Mount Carmel. Again, things are basically staying as they had been. And so he considers his ministry then a failure. And in that state of discouragement, of despair, he wants to die, and he prays that the Lord would take his life. And he says, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. My ancestors were not successful in keeping the majority in the northern kingdom from apostatizing, and my ministry has been no better than theirs. And so, in that condition, he wants to die. So at this point, God now will minister to his minister. And we see the love and the mercy and the grace and the sensitivity of Yahweh. And so Yahweh sends an angel to Elijah, and this angel provides for Elijah this special miraculous food, which gives him this extraordinary sustenance. And Elijah then, nourished by that meal, proceeds 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb or to Mount Sinai. Now, how does he know how to go, that he's to go to Mount Sinai? Either this is an unrecorded command from Yahweh or from the angel, or he derives that from the angel's words to him, you know, eat, drink, because the journey is too much for you. And perhaps from those words, he understood he was to go to Mount Sinai. Well, he does travel, and he travels then, as the text says, 40 days and 40 nights. Now, going from Beersheba, in fact, the day's journey south of Beersheba, and looking on the map from that point to Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, and considering and thinking that that mountain was located in the southern Sinai Peninsula, a vigorous man traveling in the wilderness yet would not have needed 40 days and 40 nights to get to Mount Sinai. And Elijah was a vigorous man. And so what is the point then of the 40-day period, 40-day, 40 40-night 40 period? Well, one thought is this. Elijah was using this in preparation in preparation for his meeting with God, which he knew would take place on Mount Horeb. Another thought is this. This is another connection of the prophet Elijah with Moses, and many parallels can be drawn between those two prophets. Because 40 was a prominent number in the life of Moses. Consider this. Moses fled Egypt at the age of 40. He stayed in Midian for 40 years. The Israelites, after the Exodus, were in the wilderness for about 40 years under the leadership of Moses. At the end of that time, Moses died. Moses stayed on Mount Sinai 40 days and 40 nights and ate no bread and drank no water. Then Moses, having come down from the mountain, lay prostrate before Yahweh for 40 days and 40 nights taking no bread or water. Later, Moses was again on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. So again, this could be another reason for the 40 days and 40 nights that Elijah took. This was another connection with the ministry and life of Moses. Brothers, may the Lord bless your meditation on this text and your use of it in teaching and in preaching to your people. The Lord be with you.